Hi, this is Elliot from EO Nutrition, and in today's video, this is gonna be the first of a two-part series where we are going to be looking at a condition called seborrheic dermatitis. So in this two-part series, we will examine two key B vitamins which have been implicated in the pathogenesis of seborrheic dermatitis. We'll also be looking at why people who are on ketogenic, low-carb, or zero-carb carnivorous diets might be more predisposed towards developing these deficiencies. Now, the reason I'm making this video is because I see um, this playing out quite frequently in clinical practice. Many people come to me for this specific problem, and so I'm gonna lay out why I think that it happens in these diets and what you can potentially do about it. So first of all, if we look at seborrheic dermatitis, for those who are not familiar with the symptoms, it often presents as a dry, scaly, red rash on the face. It might affect the nose, the cheeks, uh, it can affect the eyebrows. So you can see on this image, um, it can also produce dandruff. So dandruff is said to be produced by the same um, yeast which is involved in seborrheic dermatitis of the face. It can affect behind the ears, around the nostrils, and also um, around the beard as well. So wherever the skin is producing high amounts of sebum, this is potentially gonna foster um, the dry, scaly skin, the flaky rash. And so if you look at the research, it's pretty clear that one of the things involved is something called, um, it's a certain type of yeast, it's re I'm not sure how to pronounce it, I think it's malassezia or malassezia yeast. Anyway, basically this is a commensal yeast which ordinarily lives on the skin and doesn't cause problems. But in seborrheic dermatitis, certain people can actually develop an immune response or an inflammatory response against the yeast. And this is one of the things which, um, which causes like a, a mild form of inflammation on the skin and contributes to the dry scaly rash. So the typical um, treatment, the conventional medical treatment anyway, is topical steroids and antifungal creams. Oftentimes this is just dealing with the symptom and doesn't necessarily get to the root cause. Some people are also not responsive to this therapy. So there are several factors involved in why someone might be experiencing this. So it, it turns out that there appears to be a local immune dysfunction. So an immune dysfunction in the skin, on the skin barrier, there is a defective epidermal barrier, um, much like you would see in eczema. And there's potentially also abnormal lipid composition of the sebum. So sebum is like an oily substance which we secrete onto the skin um, and this maintains the health of the skin. The problem is is that the type of fats which are contained within the sebum can affect what kind of um, microorganisms grow on the skin. So this particular type of yeast, um, this is generally present on everyone's skin but only some people develop a problem with it or an immune response against that and it is potentially gonna be affected by the lipid composition or the fat composition of the sebum that that person is producing. So if we look at the literature, there are a couple things involved here, but there are two key deficiencies or two key B vitamins which come up time and time again, and these are riboflavin or vitamin B2 and biotin or vitamin B7. Now in today's video, we are gonna specifically focus on riboflavin vitamin B2, look at why this might be low on low carb, zero carb, or ketogenic diets, and then how we can potentially address that. Riboflavin is found in many different foods. It's found mostly in animal foods. The highest source by far is animal livers. So this is extraordinarily high in rib riboflavin. Also salmon, um, milk products, so riboflavin is quite high in milk, and also red meat and egg yolks. However, if we're looking at the sheer content, liver comes on top by far. Let's go through some basic biochemistry of how we are processing riboflavin. So we are absorbing it, we're transporting it through the blood, and what we need to do is activate it into one of two active coenzymes. So one is referred to as flavin mononucleotide, 
And what we're doing is we're running from riboflavin through an enzyme called riboflavin kinase, we're phosphorylating it, and this is under the action of active thyroid hormone, primarily thyroid hormone T3. And so actually the um, hypothyroidism is going to potentially affect how well we are able to activate riboflavin in the body. Anyway, so once we have activated it to something called FM, FMN, we are running that through another enzyme called FAD synthase, and that is producing FAD. So these are the two primary active forms, FAD and FMN. Now, if we're looking at how we use riboflavin, what it is important for in the body, it's really central in energy metabolism. So it's involved in something called the Krebs or the TCA cycle as an electron acceptor where it's carrying and transporting electrons from one molecule to another molecule. It's also critical in another portion of energy metabolism referred to as the electron transport chain. So this is in the mitochondria again, this is where um, FAD, one of the active forms of riboflavin, is again donating electrons to one of the complexes to allow us to synthesize ATP. Now, aside from its participation in energy redox reactions, it's also essential for how we are um, reducing or regenerating one of the primary antioxidants, in fact, the key cellular antioxidant called glutathione. So it's, an, it's a cofactor for an enzyme called glutathione reductase. This is how we are essentially adding back electrons to glutathione to allow glutathione to then go on to combat oxidative stress, oxidative damage elsewhere. Now, some of you may be familiar with the methylation cycle. Well, there is an enzyme referred to as MTHFR. This is how we are processing folate into its active form so it can participate in the methylation cycle. And the cofactor for this, again, is FAD. So we need B2 for MTHFR to be functioning correctly. Now, Chris Masterjohn has done um, a beautiful podcast explaining how potentially MTHFR issues may just be due to an underlying suboptimal riboflavin status. So riboflavin, again, key in energy metabolism, key in the antioxidant system, but also in the methylation cycle. Now we've spoken about how riboflavin is a cofactor in energy metabolism, but here is where it gets really important to understand. Riboflavin is central, is so important for how we are breaking down fats for energy, okay? Really, really important here. So riboflavin plays a role, it is a cofactor for an enzyme called acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. And what this is essentially um, involved in is something called the beta oxidation. So beta oxidation, how we are cleaving carbon from fats and how we are then going to use them for energy. And so what this means is that the more fat that someone eats, the higher the riboflavin requirement. Okay, we look at zero carb, we look at low carb ketogenic diets, we see these are very fat heavy, and therefore what this is potentially doing is placing a very large burden on our riboflavin status. Just to drill in the point, the more fat that you eat, the more riboflavin you need. It's as simple as that. And so this might be why when someone goes on a carnival or ketogenic diet, if they are not getting enough riboflavin, or if, if their riboflavin status is already suboptimal, they may not do well. They may be fatigued because they can't do, they can't burn fat for energy. And they may also be um, hampering their riboflavin status by eating such a fat heavy diet. Some of the key deficiency symptoms, and these are the things which I see really commonly. Generally, it's going to, the, the main symptoms are gonna present either in the mouth, on the skin, or on the eyes. So in the mouth, someone may see a red or swollen or patterned tongue. One of the key symptoms is having cracks or sores on the lips and at the corners of the mouth. This is very common. Someone may develop mouth ulceration. They may have a sore throat. On the skin, again, this is called seborrheic dermatitis. So we may have dandruff. We may have dry, flaky skin on the scalp. 
on the face, around the mouth, around the nose, around the beard or the eyebrows. It can also occur at other places of the body, such as the armpits or the genitals. In the eyes, this is something that I also see for quite frequently, is people who have photophobia, so they are very sensitive to bright light. There is a couple of different eye conditions which are responsive to riboflavin, so blepharitis or keratitis. I see a lot of people come to me with chronic eye, eye conditions that respond very well to riboflavin supplementation. And finally, there is also a type of anemia which is unresponsive to iron. So if someone presents with typical characteristics of iron deficiency anemia, but which is not responding to iron supplementation, it is potentially due to a riboflavin deficiency because we need riboflavin to uh, process iron in the body. Some of the key risk factors for a deficiency, some of the... Um, Common ones such as alcoholism, this is common, or malabsorption. If someone has chronic diarrhea or chronic digestive issues, that is potentially going to predispose them towards low riboflavin status. Excessive physical activity. Um, so this is theorized to be because the more energy that you need to make because you are active, the more um, riboflavin and other nutrients you are going to be burning through. Like ex excessive sunlight exposure. So if someone spends a lot of time out in the sun, you see riboflavin is destroyed by light. It's quite sensitive to heat and other things as well, but particularly by light. And so essentially the riboflavin traveling around the bloodstream it, um, in the context of sitting outside in the sun for a very long time, not that I'm against that. In fact, I think it's, it's health promoting to get lots of UV and sunlight exposure. The problem is, is that this is going to affect riboflavin status and so likely it's going to increase the requirements. Overcooking and food storage, so if food is left out in the light for a long time, this is also potentially going to destroy riboflavin. And then as I've already said, a high fat intake in the diet. This is going to be one of the key risk factors, especially in the context of ketogenic or zero carb diets. So how might we test for riboflavin status? Well, there's a couple of ways that we can do this. Um, we can look at something called a urinary organic acids test, and there are a couple of different markers on the test depending on which one you go for. Um, generally, you, these are some of the fatty acid markers, so adipic, ethyl malonic acid, glutaric acid, and suberic acid. You will see these elevated. In the blood, you might see low red blood cell glutathione reductase activity. Remember that glutathione reductase is, um, we need riboflavin for that enzyme to work. And so when that activity is low, that could be due to a riboflavin deficiency. And then also something like uh, whole blood riboflavin would be low on a lab court panel. Here is an example of what you might see. This is from one of my clients who had a very severe riboflavin deficiency and responded marvelously to that. This is a urinary organic acids panel. Um, and so this individual clearly massive elevations in some of the fatty acids and also in the glutaric acid marker. So what have I found to work with clients? Well, since liver and other organs are extremely high in riboflavin, I find that some people need those. Now that's not to say that everyone should be eating that because I understand some people have problems tolerating organ meats, but for those who can tolerate it, the eating organ meats, eating liver, kidney, these kinds of things is going to be a great way to boost up riboflavin status. If this is not successful, I will generally um, recommend a supplement being either uh, 100 milligrams to 300 to 400 milligrams in certain cases. Um, and if this is unsuccessful, I will usually recommend testing. Now, some people like to do it the other way around. They like to test first and then identify what's going on. It really depends on an individual's budget and their overall aims. So that is generally what I've found to work. In the next video, we will be looking at the second B vitamin involved in seborrheic dermatitis in dandruff and in these kind of dry scaly skin dermatitis issues, and that is biotin. We'll also be looking at why that might be low on a carnivorous or ketogenic diet and what you might be able to do about it. So stay tuned for next video. If you like this video or you found it helpful, please like and subscribe to my page. You can share it 
um, if you know that this might apply to anyone that you're familiar with, share it with them and see what they think. Thank you and see you next time.